Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on the website, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I will send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com and this video is about my first thoughts after using the Sony A1 out in the real world. Now this is not a review just yet. We haven't had it long enough to run it through its paces, to do enough comparisons, to give it a full on review status in a video. Also, we can't open raw files yet in Adobe Lightroom. Now, Imaging Edge from Sony lets you open them and export them as TIFFs, but you cannot export them as DNGs, and that software is pretty much garbage, and that's why I'm waiting to be able to put them into Lightroom so that I can analyze the files and then call it a review. As you can tell, I've got a lot of information to share in this video, but there's going to be plenty of future videos that lead our way up to a full-on real world review. So what did I shoot? I went out and photographed some football players, uh, quarterbacks indoors, there were baseball players, there were some basketball players, and as well as we had a snowstorm, we had about 12 inches of snow here in Philly, and I went outside and photographed little Dan playing in the snow. So how did I shoot all of this? This is how I shot all of this. I had to hold the camera like this using the Atomos Ninja 5 right here as my viewfinder. Why? Because I want to share with you the EVF. I want you to see all of the different things on the screen. I want you to see the buffer writing, I want you to see the settings, and I want you to see the focusing points moving. I normally wouldn't shoot like this, but this is how I had to do it with this big ass cord because we have full size HDMI here and full size HDMI here, and and that's how I had to do it. But from here on out, excuse me as I put this on the ground carefully, from here on out, there's gonna be a little Atomos on top in the future that just gets my clean out so that you can see exactly what I'm shooting. You just won't get to see the focusing points moving. That's so that I'm not using an Atomos to look up top on. But for all the photo shoots that I'm gonna do after this, I'm going back to using the electronic viewfinder and not recording the dirty out. It's important to share that. That's exactly what I did with the EOS R5 and the R6 and, all, and with all the Nikons, is we record that so that you can see it. Now before I get to the clips and analyzing the JPEGs in Lightroom, there's a couple things to talk about. How did it feel in the hands? It feels great. Sony has done, I almost dropped my paper. Sony has done a great job listening and making the body finally feel good. We saw it with the A7R4. That was the first one to feel really good in the hands. This one feels just like that. The buttons are where they need to be. There's a ton of custom function buttons right where they need to be. They're all mappable and Sony has done a masterful job with stuff like that. Now, what about the new menu system? Well, there's a new menu system. Do I like it? I mean, once I learn it, I'll like it. See, a lot of people argued and bitched that the old one was so hard to learn. It wasn't, you just had to learn it. But when I sit here and try to set up the A1 and sit there with the A7R4 next to me, they have two different menu systems. So where one thing was in one, it's not in the new one. Will I get used to it? Absolutely, it was just a pain in the butt to try and get it right off the bat. So what I'm gonna do right now is run the clips from the sporting event and then come back and talk to them and share information about the camera. All right, let's roll it.
Isn't it really cool that you can see exactly what my camera was seeing when I was shooting the photos? Everything from the focusing points to the settings, to the ISO, to the tracking, to the buffer. It's just insane that I can share that stuff and show it to you. Now, one of the challenging things in this situation is the lighting wasn't great. Look, this is what I was dealing with. We're dealing with AstroTurf, which is dark. It sucks up the light. The ceiling is painted black. It sucks up the light. The background is red. The players are wearing masks. So that is a very difficult situation to go into and try and say, well, the autofocus wasn't perfect. And I'm not trying to say it wasn't good. I'm not trying to say that it was bad. It was very good in the situations I used it in. But a lot of people are going to say, but what about it compared to the R5? I can't compare it to the R5 right now because when I was testing the R5 and the R6, it was over the summer. I was outside in awesome bright daylight and the kids weren't wearing masks. I did love the results that I got with the Canons and I'm happy with what I got with the Sonys, but I can't say, well, shooting at 4000 ISO indoors in this crappy lighting situation is a comparison to the Canon. We'll put them side by side and do other comparisons, but I just wanted to lay that out first. Let's, let's start with this image. Like I'm at 3200 ISO. That was before I pushed it up to 4000 and I'm at 1.8 and it nails it. I do want to remind you that these are JPEGs. These are JPEG finds, not the highest, highest of JPEGs. When I can open the raw files, we will know better how they handle. Also, I turned off high ISO noise reduction. That was turned off inside of the camera. And I realized that the IAF was having a little bit more trouble and I think that's because of the masks. I think if the masks weren't there we wouldn't see any issues whatsoever and I think all of the systems run into something along those lines. But also I'm shooting at 1.8 and it's sharp right on the eye right where it needs to be. I know the biggest questions for a lot of people are the high ISOs and how it handles and how it compares to the A92 and the A7R4 and from what I've seen up to the six we, we have one that's 20,000 ISO we'll look at that in a minute but the 6400 looks perfectly fine the 5000 and the 4000 look perfectly fine and I'm happy to shoot at those higher ISOs. Um, this is great because we're tracking the player coming right at me. Here he is and he's running forward and I'm shooting at 1.8, it locks on the eye, the eye is perfectly sharp and the file looks fine. Again, we're looking at JPEGs, I'm happy with those results. Here we have the player running off to the side a little bit before he steps back and throws on the move. Also, not only is he wearing a mask, He's wearing a hat, which puts shadows on the eyes. We're at 4,000 ISO, we're at 1.8. The fact that you can shoot at 1.8 for sports is insane. Now, I'm not saying you're always going to do that. I did it here just to see if it could manage to do it, plus to separate the background just a little bit, and it absolutely did with, what was I using? The 135 1.8. That lens crushed all day long. Now I want to show you what it looks like to shoot 30 frames per second. Now, this is compressed 30 frames per second. Here we go, I'm just gonna hold down the arrow. Look at this, it's like watching a video. It's literally going through like a video because you're shooting at 30 frames per second. Now the only way you can shoot at 30 frames per second is to shoot in compressed raw. One of the issues I ran into right away is I figured that when I go to H plus on top of the camera that it would automatically dumb down the file to compressed like what Nikon does. When I go into the Nikons and I shoot in the H plus modes or whatever they call it and you're shooting at the 12 or 14 frames per second, it automatically makes it a compressed 12-bit RAW file. I expected the Sony to do the same, that when I go from H to H plus, it should automatically know that if I'm, if I'm in uncompressed RAW, it should go into compressed RAW and give me 30 frames, but it didn't. When I first started shooting in H plus, I was only getting 20 frames. I got 21 frames and I couldn't figure out why. And that's because I needed to physically go into the camera and change it to compressed RAW from uncompressed, which is a pain in the butt. I can't just set a button to do that. It's just not there. I could set the top dial and uh, as one of my custom one, two, or threes, but that's again, I gotta take my eye off of this. Why can't I just turn this dial to H plus and have it automatically do it? But look, 
I was shooting all these at 1.8 again. You're normally not going to shoot sports like that, but I wanted to keep the ISO at a pretty reasonable clip just for this. But look at this. You can just go through and pick one at a time. Like, I like that. I like this because I like where the ball is and I like where the glove is. And you can zoom in, and that is in focus right there. Now, what I'll tell you is that you're using CF Express Type A cards, the smaller ones compared to the B cards. And you'll notice that the buffer doesn't write as fast to the cards as it does with the Canons. The reason for that is Canon is using the CF Express Type B cards, and those B cards are twice as fast as the A cards, but also Canon files are much smaller. Canon has a 45 megapixel sensor, and the size of the file is 45 megapixels. With the Sony, when you shoot compressed RAW, you're getting 60 megabyte files. Now, when you shoot uncompressed, they're around 110 megabytes, but it can write to the buffer. I never outran the buffer throughout this entire shoot, and the, the, the cards are still fast writing. Plus, I should say that Sony has two CFA card slots in here, and the Canon has one CF Type B and one SD. Now that I mentioned SD, do not use SD cards in this camera unless you need to. The writing speeds are so much slower. It's going to take minutes if you shoot 150 some shots in a row to get them written back to the card. All right, back here to the computer. We can just go through that one more time. It's fun to watch and just sit here and pluck out the shot. Look at this. Look at this. Look, like from the time it leaves the hand, one, two, three, four times, like four pictures with the ball in there. That's what you get with 30 frames a second. Now, some people will say, but Canon could do 20 frames a second with the R5. It can with compressed files, whereas right here with the Sony, I am shooting this in 20 frames per second, uncompressed RAW. Now, you can do this with the Sony in uncompressed RAW at 20 frames per second, where the Canon can do it at 20 frames per second, but it is compressed. Plus, you're getting a super fast readout speed with this stack sensor. It's amazing what this stack sensor can do and what it means for the future of photography, because I think at some point we're done with mechanical shutters because of the tech that Sony has come out with. But look, let me go back a few of these because I picked the one that I like. I'm like, all right, where, where do I want to go? I like that one. I like where his foot is. One of these two. Where's the glove between this and that? right? Finding out which one you like. So you can do that. This is at 6400 ISO. Looks clean to me from the JPEG, which I had high ISO noise reduction off. And then I had this file. I just liked it. I just saw that you could see everything with the 12 millimeter. I'm shooting at 12 millimeters um, and the focus was right on him. Let me jump in here to ask you, are you looking for a professional to critique your work or to give you some mentorship because you're kind of tired of your friends saying that all of your photos are great and your family's like, these are amazing and you're not really sure and you want some professional feedback? Well, I just launched 45 minute one-on-one -on -one mentorship calls with me or 15 minute recorded rapid fire critiques. Head on over to fronosphoto.com slash mentorships. You can choose between a recorded 15 minute rapid fire critique or live one-on-one -on -one mentorship calls over Zoom with me. Go ahead and add it to the cart if you'd like to do that. But on this page, you can also watch full unedited versions of a rapid fire critique as well as a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Now, let's get back to the video. And then I just want to show you this photo that I liked. I just like the angle of it and what you can get with the 12 millimeter lens. Speaking of lenses, can you get 30 frames per second with all of the lenses? And the answer is no. One of the GM lenses, the G Master lenses you can't is with the 85 1.4 from Sony. You will not get 30 frames per second. With the other ones, you absolutely can. The reason is they have the newer focusing motors and tech that can speak right to the camera. They can move and they can do it. Now, what about third party lenses? From what I'm told is that with certain Sigma lenses, you'll get 50 15 frames a second. And the reason is that the way that those lenses are designed, the motors are different. It's not the same thing that Sony's doing. So you're only going to get 15 from what I'm told. I haven't fully tested that out yet, but you will not get the same 30 frames per second. But is 15 bad? No. And can Canon do better? Well, you don't can't, you can't get third party lenses on there unless you adapt them but they adapted very well when I used them. And with Nikon, there's no third-party lenses either natively. So at least you can still use the third-party lenses here on the Sonys, like my 35 1.2, but I don't always need 30 frames a second. 
but having the option is nice to have. Next up, we went to 20,000 ISO just because we could, and I threw on a 402.8. In this little area isn't the easiest thing to do, but let's zoom in on these two shots. Um, again, not RAW files, these are from JPEGs. This is zoomed in 100%. I guarantee you if I printed this out on the printer, on the Canon Pro 1000, you would never know the difference that this wasn't at say 4000 because of the size. You just have to remember that when you're zooming in one to one with any camera, you're enlarging it to such an extreme that you wouldn't see it unless you printed it the size of a billboard. Um, does this one look as good? This one's looking a little softer to me, but the next one looks like it hit his eye better. This is 20,000 ISO. You're probably not gonna find yourself in this situation too often, but in this situation, it was able to track the subject, and this is just to show you what you can get. And I'll upload these files to Flickr so you can download the full res, um, and when I get raw files, I'll open those up to you as DNGs so you can download them. Luckily for me, this is a multi-sport building, and I saw a kid playing basketball, which had better lighting, and I went up and I said, guys, would it be all right if I take some photos? They said, sure. I told them I would send them them when the embargo was over, and I shot the basketball. Now, I'm at 4,000 ISO here. I'm using the 70 to 200 2.8, and you would expect the 70 to 200 2.8 to be better focusing. On that one, it didn't nail it. On this one, it nailed it from the side, and it looks fine. On the next one, it's not perfectly sharp. It's not as tack sharp as I would want it to be. Is that nitpicking? just a little bit, but the reason I'm nitpicking is because look at this at 135, 1.8 at 2.2. Look at the difference. You see how sharp and clean that is? That lens is just so much better than 135, 1.8. It's so much better than the 70 to 200. Even this shot, you would say, well, but what about action? Here's action shooting now at 2.8. This, it's still loading, but boom, it looks great. It's nice and sharp, and the 70 to 200 is not a good lens on the Sony cameras anymore. It might have been good when it came out, but it is not sharp. I run into a lot of issues. It's hit or miss. It's actually more miss than hit. And I, I, I found, I'm not the only one who says that. I have some friends that have it who say it back focuses, mine back focuses, it's slower. And I just proved to you at 135 at f2.2, it was nailing it and you could see how much sharper it was. The 7200 needs to be redone. When they redo it and put out a version two, it needs to be smaller, it needs to be lighter, and it needs to be agile and able to lock on the focus. And the last one I wanna show you is this wide angle one done at 12 millimeters. I locked onto the subject, and you can see the teal box lighting up. I didn't know that this was an option. I thought in the A9, it just had a gray box around the outside, which was very hard to see in a lot of lighting situations, but now the focusing point lights up teal when you're taking pictures so that you know you're taking photos, but it's incredible that you can go through and pick which shot is the one that you want, and that's what you get when you take those quick bursts. Now, I didn't just want to shoot indoors. I wanted to get outside, and thankfully, well, not thankfully, we had 12 inches of snow out there, and little Dan got to play in the snow. That's Dan, our editor's son, and he's a good subject for me to photograph because he's not wearing a mask, but he is wearing a hat, which kind of covers the eyes, which makes it a little difficult in some situations, but outdoors, I could get to a, a base ISO. I could have a little bit more control, and because he wasn't wearing a mask, we could see how the IAF and face detect actually does. Steven, go ahead and roll those clips.
let's talk about 153 images in a row, shooting 30 frames per second, compressed raw with the 135 at f2.2. This is five seconds worth of images. You literally can come in here and pluck out the one that you want. We can stop right here and zoom in. Let's see how this one did. That one looks to be in focus to me. That looks good. Boom. And let's keep going. 153 shots. The point is, not every one of these shots is going to be perfect and in focus. In fact, I went through here and I, and I found some, let's see, oh my god, there's so many. But I stopped right here and I'm like, alright, this one looks, one of these looks good. Yeah, look at that, that's the eyes up. Eyes up looks good. Next shot, well the eyes are closed, not as good, but they're still in focus. The next one looks like it moved out, followed by another one out, back in, back out back in, and back in. That's 153 images in five seconds. You are chewing up the memory. Speaking of memory, the only people making CF Express Type A cards right now, I believe is Sony, and they put out the 160 gigabyte cards. Those are 400 bucks. Now when Prograde makes and releases their CF Express Type A cards, I venture to say that they might be less expensive but I do recommend that you do get these cards, the, the Type A's, and not use SD like I said. So it's insane that you can go through that many images, isolating the subject, fighting with the snow, and get a lot of them tack sharp. To me, it's about the quick bursts. You know, getting a, a bunch of shots in a row, you're getting a lot of that quick. You're not gonna hold it down for five seconds. I did that here as a test to see if I would outrun the outrun the buffer and also to show you how it worked. And I think I did a pretty good job of showcasing that, but I wouldn't do that in the real world if I was shooting. I would never shoot for five straight seconds, but you can if you want to. All right, let's jump through these shots. We got this black and white. I just thought that was great at F2.2 of little Dan out here at 1000 ISO because it was almost getting dark. It was like 430 when we shot this. Next up, we've got this shot is at base ISO of 100, shot at 1 250th of a second at 1.8, and it looks really nice to me. It looks like it found the eyes and not just the hat, or maybe from the distance, it's able to get both in focus, and that's not a problem. It's just one of those things you need to be careful of is that if the hat's so low, maybe it has trouble finding the eye, but in this situation, it looks like it hit it and did well. Uh, moving in a little closer, we're at 1 2500th of a second. This is base ISO of 100 as well. Eyes look great. You're not always going to shoot at 2.2, but when you can do it, you're going to do it. This brings us in even closer at 1 4,000th of a second, and I was as high as 1 12,800th of a second, because with this, I can shoot wide open at 1.8, I can shoot at base ISO of 100, and just bump that shutter speed up if I need to, to compensate, because nothing else goes past 1 8,000th of a second. I was at 1 12,800th for some of them if I needed. Um, nice and sharp, right on the eye, not eyelash AF, that looks beautiful. The next one looks just as good right there. Uh, this was a fun one from a distance. You can see how the IAF just tracked him. I was going whoop, whoop, as he was going back and forth, um, bouncing back and forth. And I, and I think it's, I mean, look how sharp and beautiful that is. I cannot wait to get the raw files. And finally, this picture right here, just to show you that it found his eyes between the bars, which isn't always easy to do. Not the greatest picture since sliced bread, but I do like that shot. Now, it wasn't my intention to make this a super long video. There's just so much information to talk about. And these are just my first thoughts after using it for a couple of days in the situations where I used it in. Again, this is not a review. There's a lot more work to do. There's a lot of comparisons to be done against the, the Canon R5 because a lot of people want to know how does the R5 hold up and to be honest with you after using this A1 the Sony A1 makes the Canon R5 look really good. It's less expensive. It can do a fantastic job with autofocus. It shoots at 20 frames per second with the silent shutter. Of course it's compressed. It's not exactly the same but it is a very good system. I think we're seeing that across the board with Canon and Sony is that they've done a fantastic job. Major props have to go to Canon for what they've done with the autofocusing system because it's very difficult now to sit here and say well that Sony's is by far better because Canon's has done really well they they are very comparable now and I didn't know that I would get to that 
realization this soon into the game, but I think Canon has done a fantastic job. And Sony continues to do a fantastic job and keeps evolving. This is a fantastic camera, the A1. The autofocus is insane. 30 frames per second is insane. The stack sensor is insane. We're looking at a camera that replaces, for me, personally replaces the A7R4 and the A92 and puts it into one body. Yes, it's expensive, but this is the body for me as of right now. But where Sony needs to get better is we need to see some better glass. Where are the 1.2s? Redo that 70 to 200 because Canon's RF line of lenses are unbelievable. 28 to 70 F2. You've got the Hebrew Trinity. You've got 1.2 lenses. You have a lot of options over there on the Canon side that would be nice to see Sony catch up and do some better lenses, but only time will tell. There's a lot more that we need to do. I thank you guys for watching this. If you got this far, hashtag I got this far down below. Thank you very much for watching. Jared Polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.